Good morning and happy Sabbath to all of you. Indeed, it is a very blessed Sabbath. My wife and I, we're very happy to be visiting here with you uh, once again on this Sabbath day. And today, I'm going to be sharing with you a children's story. I'm going to be sharing with you a children's story with some lessons from that children's story. And then we are going to close. So this children's story has really touched my life a lot. And I can tell you my personal testimony this morning. Since implementing what I am going to share with you today, I have experienced many, many blessings in my life. So you can listen today and then you can put it to the test by tasting and seeing if the Lord is good. That is a principle he's given us in the Bible. And you can see if it results in blessings in your life. We live in a time where it's very difficult to just trust what people say. I guess it's always been like that, but maybe now it's even more dangerous. So whenever I say something, if I say, God's prophet says this or the Bible says this, you better take some note and make sure that it is true. Because I can be very charismatic and I can shout and sound very excited and things like that, but maybe what I'm saying is not true. Or maybe I can stand here and I can share a story and the tears are running down my cheeks. But maybe what I'm saying is not true. Satan is very, very cunning. And he knows his time is short. He will be very happy if we just sit and we just believe and uh, everything that we hear. Today's children's story that I'm going to be sharing with you is about Daniel and the lion's den. You know, when we think about children's stories, there's always like a couple of stories that comes to mind. Maybe Moses and Joseph and Daniel. Maybe there are some more complicated stories we try to avoid for children's stories. Today I'm going to be talking about a Daniel and the lion's den. Must be one of the most well-known stories in the Bible. When Darius took over uh, the kingdom, he quickly reorganized the government. He elected three presidents in his kingdom, and Daniel was one of those presidents. In fact, he was the first president in Darius' kingdom. And Darius, he really, really liked Daniel a lot, because there was something different about Daniel. He was different from the other people who worked in Darius' government. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 6 that there was an excellent spirit in Daniel. Daniel was a, he was a child of God. But you know, other leaders in this kingdom, they became quite jealous of Daniel. And they started looking for something wrong in his life so that they could get him into trouble. So maybe something like this has happened to you. Maybe this is one way you can relate to Daniel. Maybe you haven't been thrown in a lion's den yet. But maybe this is one way you can relate to Daniel. Maybe there are some people who don't like you or who didn't like you and they try to look for something in your life, something that you've done wrong, so they can try to get you in trouble. Maybe even if you're still in school, maybe some of your friends at school who don't like you, they try to look for something in your life that you do wrong. They want to get you in trouble with your teacher. Or maybe at your workplace, some of your colleagues, they don't like you. They try to get you into trouble somehow because of some jealousy. Or maybe, maybe you've been that person. Maybe you've been the person trying to get someone else into trouble. Maybe you have been that person looking for something bad and wrong in someone else's life so that you can get them into trouble. In Daniel chapter 6 verse 4, the Bible says, then the presidents and rulers sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find no occasion or fault because he was faithful. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. And then verse 5 says, Then these men said, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. And then you probably know the rest of this story. They made a worship law, and Daniel ended up in the lion's den with the lions. And when I read this story, and I look at Daniel, some interesting things that I can see. 
You know, Daniel didn't start saying mean things about these other people who made this law trying to get him into trouble. He didn't start saying bad things about them. He didn't start posting on his Facebook about how unfair and how unjust this law is, even though it was very unjust and very unfair. He didn't start marching in the streets, protesting, saying, this law is so unfair, I shouldn't be going to the lion's den, I'm just minding my own business, why are you throwing me in the lion's den? I don't find any of that in the story. What I find is that Daniel, even though he's being treated unfairly, unjustly in heaven's eyes, Daniel submits to this unfair punishment of the government, even though he was innocent in heaven's eyes. It's amazing what God can do in the life of people who love him, how he changes their character and their attitude and their outlook in life, even when they are being treated unfair and unjust. So then God miraculously saves Daniel inside the lion's den. So he still faced a very difficult time. He still had to go inside the lion's den, which must have been very, very scary. So in our life, God might allow us also to go through very difficult times. And we know that just like God was with Daniel in the lion's den, if God allows us to go through difficult times, if we have that same faith that Daniel had, then we can also be assured, just like Daniel, that God will be with us through those difficult times. So from this story, I can see Daniel's character was the same during the good times when he was outside the lion's den, And when he was inside the lion's den, he was still faithful to God. Maybe similar to Job. Even during the good times and during the bad times, the character was still the same. Those people who trust in God, even though we may feel discouraged or bad things might happen to us in life, our trust and our faith in God can remain stable even when our life is going up and down. So maybe you've also experienced some bad things in your life. I haven't been thrown in a lion's den yet, but... I have experienced some bad things in my life, and I don't have to think about uh, 10 years ago or 20 years ago. I can even think, think of things very recently. And maybe you can also think of some things that's happened in your life quite recently that might might be a bit discouraging or a little bit uh, bad. I remember just a couple of weeks ago, maybe two or three weeks ago, so it's not that long ago, I woke up one morning and I saw on my cell phone there's a lot of notifications on my phone. So I unlock my phone and I look at the notifications and I see in my messages there's like OTP from the bank sent to my phone, like 2, 3 a.m. in the morning. And when I open my bank account, I see that my money has been stolen. So maybe that's not as bad as being thrown in the lion's den, right? But that's still something that's not so nice, right? When you wake up in the morning after a peaceful night's sleep and you see uh, your money has been stolen. So if anything like that ever happens to you, you can just speak to my wife and I. We can share with you uh, what steps you should take. If that happens to you, we have lots of experience. Because that isn't even the first time that it's happened. It's already happened before. So that's something bad, right, that happens in life. But how do I respond in a situation like that? Is my faith and trust in God still the same as it was on the Thursday night when I went to bed and my money was still in my bank? And then Friday morning when I wake up and the money is gone, is my faith and trust in God still the same? Or does it suddenly change and now I lose my faith and my trust in God? But in Daniel's life, I can see during the good times and the bad times, even though he's treated unfairly because he's faithful to God and he loves God, even though his life is going up and down, his faith in God seems to be uh, very stable. He trusts God even during that uh, difficult time. And Daniel, he was a man just like us. Facing temptations, just like us. Staying in a country where lots of people, vast majority of the people, do not believe in God. But the Bible says that Daniel was without fault. So in verse 4, it says there, they could find nothing against him. No fault, because he was faithful. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. Now, dear friends, the Bible doesn't lie. The Bible says that Daniel was faithful and that there was no fault in him. Daniel chapter 6 verse 4. So be very careful when people tell you that you cannot be without fault. Be very careful. 
they are not sharing with you the same message that the Bible is sharing. They are sharing with you something different. Is it possible to live a life with no fault? Is it possible to live a life where we don't do what is wrong? This is what the Bible says about the life of Daniel in Daniel chapter 6 verse 4. The Bible doesn't lie. In Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, page 76, God's prophet says, The conditions of eternal life under grace are just what they were in Eden. Perfect righteousness, harmony with God, perfect conformity to the principles of God's law. This standard is not one to which we cannot attain. So in the Bible, we know from Daniel's life, in Daniel chapter 6, verse 4, that Daniel was without fault. And in Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, it tells us that the standard of eternal life is still the same through all of the ages. Perfect obedience to God's commandments. And this is not a standard which we cannot attain. Then in the Desire of Ages, page 311, God's prophet also says, Satan is jubilant. Satan is very happy when he hears the professed followers of Christ making excuses for their deformity of character. It is these excuses that lead to sin. There is no excuse for sinning. A holy temper, a Christ-like life, is accessible to every repenting, believing child of God. Daniel was just like you and just like me. Someone with a sinful human nature, facing temptations every day, but by taking hold of God's grace and through repentance, Daniel was able to live a life of faithfulness, a life where there was no fault. So even though we have all, all sinned, when we were ignorant of God's grace and the Bible truth, after we repent and we have faith in God, we can be without fault, just like Daniel. I'm sure you know that, that hymn, Dare to be a Daniel. Very beautiful song. Maybe for the song leaders, maybe you can, we can sing that song after this children's story. So Amazing Facts actually has, has a booklet, if you've ever heard of Amazing Facts. I'm sure you've heard of them before. Amazing Facts, they have a booklet, it's called... Is it possible to live without sinning? And if you are interested in this topic, I really suggest that you read that booklet, and I'm more than willing to share it with you if you don't know where to find it. So unfortunately, many times we sing that song, Dare to be a Daniel, but we don't really believe that we can live the same life as Daniel, a life without fault, a life without doing what is, what is wrong. But God can do in your life just what he did in Daniel's life. God can do in your life just what he did through the life of Jesus as well. So the men who were jealous of Daniel, very closely they looked at every aspect of Daniel's life concerning the kingdom. So they looked at his business transactions. They investigated all of his business transactions and they couldn't find anything wrong with Daniel's business transactions. They looked at how he treats other people in the kingdom, his, his colleagues, maybe people working under him. They can't find anything wrong with Daniel. Daniel always comes to work on time. Maybe they have one of those electronic things where you scan your finger and they check his record. Daniel is always there on time, doesn't uh, clock out early. Oh, what a faithful guy. Maybe when he's riding his chariot, Daniel is always keeping the speed limit. They look at Daniel's record, riding his chariot, always obeying the road rules there in Darius's kingdom. If he was living in our day, Daniel always wearing his motorbike helmet. They can't find anything wrong with Daniel. Daniel reports all of his income and he faithfully pays all of his tax. <laughs> they can't find anything wrong with Daniel. Daniel, as a foreigner there in Darius' kingdom, he has all the correct paperwork. Maybe if it's a visa or a work permit that's required. They look at Daniel's life, they can't find anything wrong. He doesn't use his work time to do his private business. He doesn't steal pencils from Darius' palace to use at home to draw his pictures. They look at every aspect of Daniel's life and they can't find anything wrong. 
He doesn't pretend to be a Babylonian so that he can go into the Babylonian or the Medo-Persian uh, national parks at a cheaper price, just like the locals. He's honest in everything that he, do, that he does. They can't find anything wrong with Daniel. He follows all of the rules under Darius' kingdom. Daniel was without fault, is what the Bible tells us. Not what I'm saying or someone else is saying. God tells us that Daniel was without fault. He was a model citizen under Darius' kingdom. Daniel, because of his faith in God, not because of his own power, he was faithful. Daniel was a man of principle, is what the spirit of prophecy says. That even his enemies had to admit that he's faultless. Even his enemies. Now we can understand if your friends look at your life and they say, yeah, okay, you know, Peter, he's a, he's a good guy. He doesn't do anything, anything wrong. But if even your enemies look at your life and they say, okay, yes, Peter or Daniel, these guys are faultless, then we must know that something serious is going on. So they had to come up with a new idea. They couldn't lie or deceive or find anything small wrong, so they had to come up with a new idea to get Daniel into trouble. They had to come up with a rule that would demand disobedience to God. So I want you to think about this for a moment. Daniel's enemies had confidence in Daniel's faith in God. Daniel's enemies knew, they could see, that Daniel is such a man of principle. He loves God so much that if they make a rule for Daniel to disobey God, they had confidence that Daniel would be faithful. Because remember, their plan was not to make Daniel disobedient to God. Their plan was to get him in jail. So if they make a rule and ask him to be disobedient, and he's disobedient and he doesn't go to jail, then their plan is not successful. They were confident in Daniel's faith in God. Daniel's enemies believed that if they make a rule that Daniel should be disobedient, that Daniel will still be obedient to God and that he would be willing to go to jail. So in Daniel chapter 6, verse 16, that's where we read where they threw him into the lion's den because of his faith in God. They didn't throw him in the lion's den because he didn't pay his tax. They didn't throw him in the lion's den because he broke the speed limit or didn't wear a helmet or because he was stealing things from work. That's not the reason why. He ended up in the lion's den because of his faith in God. But if it was not for verse 4 in this story of Daniel chapter 6, then we never would have reached this point in verse 16. If Daniel was not faultless in his life in the kingdom, in terms of being obedient in his work, faithful in his work, and being without fault, then they never would have had to make a law about Daniel's faith in God. If Daniel was corrupt, then they could have thrown him in the lion's den because of that. If Daniel didn't pay his tax, they could have thrown him in the lion's den because of that. If Daniel didn't have the correct visa or work permit, they could have thrown him in the lion's den because of that. If Daniel was stealing things from work or not coming on time to work, not wearing his helmet or lying to the officers to go into the national park at a cheaper price, if Daniel did any of those things, they could throw him in the lion's den because of that. They never had to make a law about his faith in God. It was only because Daniel was faultless in all of these other things, that they had to make a law about his faith in God. Many Christians, including myself, believe that in the near future there will be a day where the government will require God's people to be disobedient to God or face some punishment. And I believe that the Bible tells us this will happen, especially in Revelation chapter 13. But I have to carefully sit and think today if the government looks at my life today, what do they see in my life? Do they see someone just like Daniel, who was faultless in all of the aspects regarding the kingdom? Or do they see someone who does do wrong things? Do they see someone who obeys all of the laws of the land? 
Or do they see someone who neglects some as not that important? Is it really necessary for Satan to make a worship law to put me in jail? Or is there so many wrong things that I already do in my life that he can already put me in jail because of all of those other things that I do? If we want to be the same as Daniel in verse 16 when they throw him in the lion's den, we first have to be the same as Daniel in verse 4 where he's faultless in everything regarding the kingdom. Many times we say that we will be like Daniel in the lion's den, dare to be a Daniel there in verse 16. But we are not prepared to live the same type of life that Daniel lived outside of the lion's den in verse 4 of that very same chapter. In counsels to the church, God's prophet comments on something that Peter wrote. In 1 Peter, you can look this up in your Bible, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 to 17. And she says the following about what Peter writes. So it's going to be one sentence, what she says, and then everything else, just Peter. She says, the apostle plainly outlined the attitude that believers should sustain toward the civil authority. And then Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 to 17. Peter says, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free as not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God, honor all men, Love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. Then in my life today, page 280, she says something very similar to what Peter says. She says, we are to recognize human government as an ordinance of divine appointment and teach obedience to it as a sacred duty within its le legitimate sphere. And then she explains, when its claims conflict with the claims of God, we must obey God rather than men. So if the law of the land asks us to disobey God, then it's more important for us to be obedient to God than to be obedient to the government. And that's what happened in Daniel's situation regarding the lion's den. But if the government does not ask us to disobey God, then it is our sacred duty to obey what is required of us. In cases like that, if we disobey the government when its claims does not conflict with God's claims, then we are not just disobeying the government, but we are in fact disobeying God. In my life today, page 280, the same, it says, Teach the people to conform in all things to the laws of their state, when they can do so without conflicting with the law of God. This is the principle that we found in the life of Daniel. Daniel was obedient in every minor little aspect of his life, except when the government's requirements conflicted with the requirements of God. Keep the speed limit. Pay your taxes. Wear your motorcycle helmet. Make sure you have the correct visa and work permit as guests in the Thai people's home. As a foreigner, we are not allowed to sell things that are not allowed according to our work permit. Don't download things illegally from the internet. Honor the king, like 1 Peter chapter 2 says. This is God's will for our life. In Mount of Blessings, page 72, God's prophet says, Jesus bade his disciples, instead of resisting the demands of those in authority, to do even more than what was required of them. And so far as possible, they should discharge every obligation even if it were beyond what the law of the land required. So during the time of Alan White, when medical missionary work was just taking off, they had a little bit of a challenge that came on their way. As they were sending people out, teaching about health and about all of these type of things, the government started requiring physicians to have licenses. Now, in our world today, that is something that's very common. Like in Thailand, if you want to work as a nurse in Thailand, you have to pass the nursing board license exams. If you want to work as a doctor in Thailand, you have to have that license from the government that allows you to, to practice. 
So some people who come from other countries who have nursing degrees cannot work as a registered nurse in Thailand unless they complete and pass that examination set by the government, which is in Thai language. So for lots of people, it's difficult. So then people saw this as an obstruction to our medical missionary work. Because now people will need to take these exams and get a license and all of these type of things. So they ask God's prophet, what does she think about this? It's going to really restrict the amount of people we can send out to do medical missionary work. What does she think about these restrictions from the government? Medical ministry, page 84, she answered, she said, Whenever we can comply with the law of the land without putting ourselves in a false position, we should do so. Wise laws have been framed in order to safeguard the people against the imposition of unqualified physicians. These laws we should respect, for we are ourselves by them protected from presumptuous pretenders. Should we manifest opposition to these requirements, it would tend to restrict the influence of our medical missionaries. If it doesn't require us to be disobedient to God, then we should accept it as something that is divinely appointed for us and for our benefit. That doesn't mean that we're going to like and agree with any, everything. Just like when I was in my parents' home, my parents had some rules that I didn't like. But it was not rules that conflicted with God's rules. My parents didn't ask me to go and rob the store and to lie to people and to steal. They had certain regulations that they believed is in the best interest of their home. So I was willing to follow those things, even though I didn't always like, like doing those things. In Thailand, for example, I don't like doing 90 days reporting. But I know that that is what the government requires of me, because they believe that that is what is best for their country. So I submit to those uh, principles. If Daniel was not faultless in all of these other areas in his life, then a worship law would never have been necessary to put him in the lion's den. And the same is true for us. If we are not faultless in our life regarding these things, then a worship law is not necessary to put us in jail or to persecute us. We already have enough reason to cause us problems and trouble. Just recently, I listened to someone that was preaching, and in their sermon, they publicly committed to an offense that carries a four-year jail term here in Thailand. And after that, I had to tell the, the people that they will have to remove that video from YouTube because the government authorities can just use that as a public confession to a crime that they have committed as a, as a leader in the church. Or sometimes we sit and we laugh about how we try to speak Thai so we can enter national parks at a cheaper price and try to deceive the people into thinking that we are Thai. And I'm thinking Eve was willing to eat the fruit because Satan promised her to be like God. We are willing to break God's commandments to lie to save 300 baht. How sad that we wait for a Sunday law, but we're not even willing to be faithful in the very small things. We wait for a worship law, but we don't even want to keep the speed limit or follow the immigration laws. This is a message that doesn't call us to look at other people and what other people are doing in their life, but for all of us to take time for some self-reflection or introspection. Where in my own life am I disobedient to the authorities that God has placed over me who I actually should be obedient? Can I truly say about my life, that I am faultless in all of these things according to my knowledge, just like Daniel was. Daniel, a normal man, just like you and me, according to the scripture, was faultless in all of these things because he was faithful and relied on God's power, and we can do it too. In Adventist Home, page 108, God's prophet says, God tests and proves us by the common occurrences of life. It is the little things which reveal the chapters of the heart. If we are not faithful in the small things, we will not be faithful in the big things. That's what Jesus said in Luke chapter 16, verse 10. He who is faithful in the least is also faithful in much. And he who is unjust in the least is also unjust in much. Galatians chapter 5, verse 9, the Bible also says, It is a little leaven leavens all the lump. Do not think for a moment that Daniel was disobedient in all of the small things in his life until he came to a big test and now suddenly he stands up for what is right. 
No. Prophets and Kings is clear that Daniel was a man of principle. Even in the very, very small things of his life, he was honest and faithful and there was integrity in his life so that when the big test comes, he's prepared to face the test. But if we are unfaithful in all of these small things, lying about small things just to save a little bit of money, when the big test comes, there's no way that we will pass. Christ Object Lessons, page 118, God's prophet says, Almost Christians, yet not fully Christians. They seem near the kingdom of God, but they cannot enter there. Almost, but not completely saved, means to be not almost, but completely lost. If we feel convicted today that there's something in my life that's keeping me away from being 100% right with God, there's still hope for you and for me. If today we realize that maybe I've been a hypocrite in pretending to that I'm going to be faithful in the future when the big test comes, a, a worship law comes, while well, in the small things, I'm not even faithful today. There's still hope for me today. There's still hope for you today. Just imagine how sad it would be if I was standing here today preaching to you guys about a coming Sunday law and how I'm going to be faithful. And as I preach this sermon, the government officer comes in from the back and they arrest me for evading taxes. Or the immigration officer comes in um, arresting me, deporting me back to go back home because I don't have the correct visa and work permit. How embarrassing that would be if I talk about all of these great things in the future that I will stand up for and be faithful for, but in the small things in life, I should actually already be in jail. In Jesus, there's hope for you and there's hope for me. A personal revival can start in my life and can start in your life. And if we are faithful in these small things, we will be faithful in the bigger things also. Then the people around us, just like in the story of Daniel, even our enemies, they can see that we are people of principle, people who are honest, people who have integrity in their life. So that when they look at you and when they look at me, they will have confidence in your faith in God. They will have confidence that if in the future there is indeed a worship law, you will be faithful to God. Why? Because there's integrity in your life, even in the very, very smallest things. Thoughts on the Mount of Blessing, page 150. It says, Do you desire to become a follower of Christ, yet know not how to begin? Are you in darkness and know not how to find the light? Follow the light you have. Set your heart to obey what you do know. His power, his very life, dwells in his word. As you receive the word in faith, it will give you power to obey. As you give heed to the light you have, greater light will come. You are building on God's word and your character will be builded after the similitude of the character of Christ. Let us decide in our hearts today to commit to the very small amount of good and true things that we know. To rely on God's word to give us the power to be faithful in those things. To be faithful in the things that we know. So that when bigger things come, we will be faithful also. As you follow the truth, the truth that you know, God will give you more truth. And moment by moment, by following truth that we know, we'll be changed little by little into the character of Jesus. Amen.